Hello and welcome to the reading of Owls and the Family by Farley Moat. We're going to be reading chapter one of the book Owls and the Family. Before we read chapter one of this book, I'd like to introduce you to a few vocabulary words that might help you understand the book a little better. This story is set in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. It's a place in the country of Canada. And I'll show you a little closer up, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan is a province in the country of Canada. And Saskatoon is a city in that province. Canada is just north of the United States of America. There you can see the province of Saskatchewan. And there's the city of Saskatoon. And I'll go out a little more so you can see it all at once. So that's the setting of this book. And we are going to be reading about yellow measles in chapter one. Yellow measles are a sickness or disease that makes small yellow spots that spread across every part of your body. And they're gonna use yellow measles to describe the prairie in this book. A prairie is a word that describes a place. The land in a prairie is flat with not many trees. A prairie has mostly grass and a few small bushes. You're gonna hear a lot about gopher holes and gopher holes are the home of a gopher. A gopher is a small rodent animal that lives underground. And there's a few different kinds of gophers depending on where you live. Where I live in Texas, the gophers rarely ever come up above the ground. But in Canada, according to this book, the gophers they have do come up above the ground occasionally. Gopher holes are dug by gophers and they look like this on the top. And they leave a big mound of dirt. And underneath they have lots of passageways under their top hole that we actually see. In this book, they use the term bluff to describe a clump of cottonwood trees on a prairie. So it's just all flat and then there's one group of trees together. And in this book, they call that a bluff. Um, I've never heard it called that before. And I asked a friend from Canada and he had not heard it called that before. But in this book, when they use the term bluff, that's what they're referring to is a group of trees, especially cottonwood trees, out on an open prairie. Haversack is a bag worn over the shoulder to carry supplies. There's a haversack. And then these words will be in chapter two, so we won't worry about them right now. Because Right now we're just reading chapter one of Owls in the Family by Farley Moat. Chapter one. One May morning, my friend Bruce and I went for a hike on the prairie. Spring was late that year in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Snowdrifts still clung along the steep banks of the river in the shelter of the cottonwood trees. The river was icy with thaw water as we crossed over the railroad bridge. We could feel a cold breath rising from it, but we felt another breath a gentle one blowing across the distant wheat fields and smelling like warm sun shining on soft mud. It was the spring wind and the smell of it made us walk faster. We were in a hurry to get out of the city and into the real prairie where you can climb a fence post and see for about a million miles. That's how flat the prairie is. The great thing about Saskatoon was the way it ended sharp all around its edge. There were no outskirts to Saskatoon. When you stepped off the end of the railroad bridge, you stepped right into the prairie, and there you were, free as gophers. Gophers were the commonest thing on the prairie. The little mounds of yellow dirt around their burrows were so thick, sometimes it looked as if the fields had yellow measles. But this day, Bruce and I weren't interested in gophers. We were looking for an owl's nest. We had decided that we wanted some pet owls. 
And if you want pet owls, you have to find a nest and get the young ones out of it. We headed out for the nearest clump of cottonwood trees that dot the prairies, and which are called bluffs out in Saskatchewan. The ground was spongy under our sneakers, and it squooshed when we hit wet, a wet place. A big jackrabbit bounced up right under my feet and scared me so much I jumped almost as high as he did. And as we came nearer the bluff, two crows came zooming out of it and swooped down on us, cawing their heads off. Caw! 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 Bluffs are funny places in the spring. The cottonwood trees shed a kind of white fluffy stuff that looks like snow. Sometimes it's so thick it comes right over the top of your stinkers, and you get the queer feeling that you really are walking through snow, even though the sun on your back is making you sweat right through your shirt. We walked through this bluff, scuffing our feet in the cottonwood snow and stirring it up in clouds. We kept looking up, and after a while, sure enough, we saw a big mess of twigs high up in a poplar. All right, Bruce said to the two crows, which were swooping and hollering at us. If you want me to snitch your eggs, I will. Do you think those crows really wanted Bruce to snitch their eggs out of their nest? Seems like they probably wanted the opposite of that. With that, he handed me his haversack and began to shinny up the tree. It was an easy climb because cottonwood poplars always have lots of branches. When he got to the nest and looked into it, I yelled up at him. Any eggs? Bruce grinned, but he wouldn't answer. I could see him doing something with his free hand, the one he wasn't holding on with. And I knew there were eggs in there, all right. I watched, and sure enough, he was popping them into his mouth so he could carry them down the tree. We always carried eggs down out of trees that way. The only thing was, crow's eggs are pretty big. And if you have to stuff three or four of them into your mouth, it nearly chokes you. Bruce started to climb down. When he got about ten feet from the ground, he stepped on a rotten branch. Poplar branches are always rotten near the ground, and you have to watch out for them. I guess Bruce forgot. Anyway... The branch broke, and he slid the rest of the way and lit on his seat with a good, hard bump. All the eggs had been broken, and Bruce was <laughs> spitting out shells and eggs all over the cottonwood snow. I got laughing so hard I couldn't even talk. When Bruce got most of the eggs spat out, he came for me and tackled me. Why do you think Bruce tackled Billy? Did you want to be laughed at when something gross was happening to you? And we had a fight. It didn't last long because it was too hot to really fight. So Bruce ate a sardine sandwich to get the taste of crow's eggs out of his mouth. And then we started to cross the prairie again to search through other bluffs until we found an owl's nest. If you had a bad taste in your mouth, would you choose a sardine sandwich as the best way to get it out? I guess that's what Bruce liked. I guess we searched about a hundred bluffs that morning, but we never saw an owl. We were getting hungry by then, so we made a sort of nest for ourselves on the ground out of poplar snow and branches, and we curled up in it and opened our haversacks. Bruce had sandwiches and a lemon in his. He was the only boy I ever knew who liked to eat lemons. He said they were better than oranges any day of the week. I had a hard-boiled egg, and just for fun I reached over and cracked the shell on Bruce's head. He yelled, and we had another fight, and I rolled all over the sardine sandwiches. We were just finishing our lunch when a wood gopher came snuffling along through the cottonwood snow. Wood gophers are gray and have big, bushy tails. This one came right up to us, 
and when I held a crust out to him, he shuffled up and took it out of my hand. Got no sense, said Bruce. You might have been a coyote, and then where'd he be at? Heck, I said, he's got a lot more sense than you. Do I look like a coyote? The gopher didn't say anything. He just took the crust and scuttled away to his hole somewhere. We picked up our haversacks. The sun was as bright as fireworks, and the sky was so clear you could look right through it, like looking through a blue window. We started to walk. All of a sudden, Bruce stopped so fast that I bumped into him. Lucky, he said, and pointed to a bluff about half a mile away. There must have been a million crows around it. It looked as if the bluff was on fire and filling the sky with black smoke. That's how many crows there were. When you see a bunch of crows all yelling their heads off at something, you can almost bet it's an owl thereafter. Crows and owls hate each other. And when a crow spots an owl, he'll call every other crow for miles and they'll all join in and mob the owl. We headed for that bluff at a run. The crows saw us coming, but they were too excited to pay much attention. We were nearly deaf with their racket by the time we reached the edge of the trees. I was ahead of Bruce when I saw something big and slow go drifting out of one poplar and into another. It was a great horned owl the biggest kind of owl there is. And as soon as it flew, the whole lot of crows came swooping down on it, cawing like fury. I noticed they were careful not to get too close. Bruce and I started to hunt for the nest. After a while, the owl got more worried about us than about the crows, and he went away. When he flew low over the fields, almost touching the ground, the way that crows couldn't dive on him. If they tried it, they would shoot past him and crash into the dirt. There wasn't any owl's nest in that bluff after all, but we didn't worry. We knew the nest would have to be in some bluff not too far away. All we had to do was look. We looked in different bluffs all afternoon. We found seven crow's nests, a red-tailed hawk's nest, and three magpie's nests. I tore the seat out of my trousers climbing to the hawk's nest, and we both got Russian thistles in our sneakers. So we had sore feet. It got hotter and hotter and we were so thirsty. I could have eaten a lemon myself, except that Bruce didn't have any more. It was past supper time when we started back toward the railroad. By then, we were pretending we were a couple of Arabs lost in the desert. Our camels had died of thirst, and we were going to die too unless we found some water pretty soon. Listen, Bruce said, there's an old well at Haltane Corner. If we cut over past Barney's Sloth to the section road, we can get a drink. Too late, I told him. Goodbye, old pal, old sheik. I'm doomed. Go, go on and leave me lay. Oh, nuts, said Bruce. I'm thirsty. Come on, let's go. So we cut past Barney's Sloth, and there were about a thousand mallard ducks on it. They all jumped into the air as we went by, and their wings made a sound like a freight train going over a bridge. Wish I had my dad's gun, said Bruce. But I was wondering why on the prairies they call lakes and ponds sloths. Have you ever heard of that? On a Canadian prairie? They call a lake 
a sloth, or a pond a sloth. I still didn't know why, but that's what they're called in Saskatoon. There's one big bluff between us and Haltane Corner. It was too far to go around it, so we walked right through it. Anyway, it was cooler among the trees. When we were about halfway through, I spotted a crow's nest in the big old cottonwood. I bet it's empty, I said to Bruce. But the truth was that I was just too hot and tired to climb any more trees. Bruce felt the same way, and we walked past. But I took one last look up at it, and there, sticking over the edge of the nest, was the biggest bunch of tail feathers you ever saw. My heart jumped right out of into my throat and I grabbed Bruce by the shirt and pointed up. It was a great horned owl, all right. We kept as quiet as we could, so as not to scare her. Then we looked around the bottom of the tree. There were bits of rabbits and gophers and lots of owl pellets. When owls catch something, they eat it whole thing bones and fur and all. Then, after a while, they burp and spit out a ball of hair and bones. That's an owl pellet. Bye, gang! We found it! Bruce whispered. I found it, I said. Okay, said Bruce. You found it. Then, so how about you climbing up and seeing how many young ones are in it? Nothing doing, old pal, I replied. I found the nest, so if you want one of the owlets, you climb up and have a look. Neither of us was keen to climb that tree. The old owl was sticking close to her nest, and you can't always tell how fierce an owl is going to be. They can be pretty fierce sometimes. Say, said Bruce after a while, why don't we just leave her be for now? But scare her into leaving the nest for good if we climbed up. What say we get Mr. Miller and come back tomorrow? Mr. Miller was one of our teachers. Bruce and I liked him because he liked the prairie too. He was a great one for taking pictures of birds and things. We knew he would be crazy to get some pictures of the owl and Mr. Miller never minded climbing trees. Sure, I said, good idea. We went off to Haltane Corner and got a drink of water that tasted like old nails out of the broken pump. Then we walked on home. That night, I told Dad about the owl's nest, and he looked at Mother, and all he said was, Oh, no, not owls, too. That was the end of chapter one of the book Owls in the Family by Farley Moat, and I hope you enjoyed that and that you'll come back and watch video two of chapter two of Owls in the Family.